Good morning. Good morning, Colin. Good morning, Richard. Good morning, Marion. We join together on the Lord's Day to worship him. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with us all. Today is the 14th of June, and it's a lovely, glorious day in Cunnelt, even here. Earlier when I was out, I measured the temperature, and it was just after 8 eight in the morning, and the temperature was 19 or 20 degrees centigrade, 19 uh, the shore, 20 further in. It just shows you what glorious weather we're having. To begin with today, I would like to share the words of an old hymn, but I think they speak to me, and perhaps they will speak to you. God is waiting in the silence for a heart that he can fill. He must find it cleansed and empty, with a spirit calm and still. God is waiting in the silence, oh, to know that he is near. Earth proceeds and heaven opens. God is waiting. God is here. I like to think of that as reminding me that wherever two or three are gathered in Jesus' name, even virtually, he is there with us. And God is waiting for our hearts. He's coming to us if we're ready for him. But with that thought, let us join together in prayer. Almighty God, how great and wonderful you are. You are the Lord of kindness and mercy. How great you are, most worthy to be praised. You are the living God. Praise be to you, Lord of all. We come before you on this, your day, to praise and to worship you for your life and your love. Father in heaven, how great it is to come into your, into your house of worship. I may be in my, on my own in this building, but I can share with others in different places. I thank you for the privilege of being able to come into the church when others are not able to. Lord, we long for the days when our churches can be opened to whoever would come for your blessing, for your peace, for the peacefulness of this place. Lord, we thank you for your goodness to us. And as we come before you, to celebrate your goodness. We are conscious of our need for your mercy. Therefore, we humbly confess our sins to you. We confess that we have sinned against you by our own fault, by our own deliberate fault. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Lord Jesus Christ, you came into the world to save sinners, have mercy on us. Lord Jesus Christ, you came into the world to bring forth goodness and truth. Have mercy upon us. Lord Jesus Christ, you came to heal and save the contrite. Have mercy upon us. Lord Jesus Christ, you plead for us at the right hand of God the Father. Grant us your peace. Lord, may we know the abundance of your grace your forgiving mercies and your joy. Come to us, Lord, today. Our hearts are ready for you. We have hearts that you can fill. Find them cleansed and empty with a spirit calm and still. Come to us, Lord, at this hour with your blessing and with your peace. Amen. Before the service really started, I was playing two hymns, and I'll read the, the first verse of the, the second, or I think the second of them. Guide me, O my great Redeemer, pilgrim through this barren land. I am weak, but you are mighty. Hold me with your powerful hand. Bread of heaven, bread of heaven, feed me now and evermore, feed me now and evermore. Open now the crystal fountain where the healing waters flow, 
Let the foul fire and cloudy pillar lead me all my journey through. Strong deliverer, strong deliverer, ever be my strength and shield. As we think of that, I would like to share with you some words from Psalm 147. And in Psalm 147, there, in the way that I've done it, there is a response. When I say, praise the Lord Jerusalem, the response that everyone joins in with, I hope, is the word alleluia. So that's not too difficult to remember, alleluia. When I say, praise the Lord Jerusalem, the response is alleluia. From Psalm 147. The Lord is restoring Israel. He is bringing back the exiles. Praise the Lord Jerusalem. Alleluia. He heals the brokenhearted and bandages up their wounds. Praise the Lord Jerusalem. Alleluia. Glorify the Lord, O Jerusalem. Praise your God, O Zion. For he has strengthened the bars of your gates and blessed your children within you. Praise the Lord Jerusalem. Alleluia. He has granted peace in your borders with the best of wheat. He fills you. He sends forth his command to the earth and swiftly runs his word. Praise the Lord Jerusalem. Alleluia. Amen and thanks be to God. I like those verses that reminds us that he is bringing back the exiles. The Lord is restoring Israel. At this time, it does feel as if the church has had a blow with lockdown. But I trust that God is bringing back his people again, as he did after the exile. When the people of Israel were in exile for those 70 years, God brought them back. But I'm sure we're not going to be away from our church buildings for 70 years. I certainly hope not. And he bandages up our wounds. He heals the brokenhearted. And if we're feeling brokenhearted or injured or tender today, let's remember that, that God binds up our wounds. In the readings for today, the first is from the book of Deuteronomy in the eighth chapter, reading verses 2 and 3, 14 to 16. Remember, the long road by which the Lord your God led you for forty years in the desert to humble you, to test you and know your innermost heart, whether you would keep his commandments or not. He humbled you, he made you feel hunger, he fed you with manna which neither you nor your ancestors had ever known, to make you understand that human beings live not on bread alone, but in every word that comes from the mouth of God. Do not become proud of heart, do not forget the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the place of slave labour, who guided you through the vast and dreadful desert, a land of fiery snakes, scorpions and thirst, who in this waterless place brought you water out of the flinty rock, who in this desert fed you with food, unknown to your ancestors, to humble you, to test you, to make your future happier. And perhaps part of that is true for us today, that we're going through a difficult time, a time that is humbling us and testing us. But if we persist with faith and trust and obedience, it will make our future even happier. And the Gospel reading, the Gospel is taken from St. John's Gospel, chapter 6 at verse 51. Jesus speaks of himself as living bread. Jesus said, I am the living bread which has come down from heaven. Anyone who eats this bread will live forever. And the bread that I shall give is my flesh for the life of the world. The Jews started arguing amongst themselves, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? Jesus replied to them, In all truth I tell you, if you do not eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Anyone who does eat my flesh and drink my blood 
as eternal life, and I shall raise that person up on the last day. For my flesh is real food, and my blood is real drink. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood lives in me, and I live in that person. As the living Father sent me, and I draw life from the Father, so whoever eats me will also draw life from me. This is the bread which has come down from heaven, not like the bread our ancestors ate. They, have, they are dead. Anyone who eats this bread will live forever. Amen and thanks be to God for these readings for his, from his holy word and to him be all glory and praise. Let us pray. Almighty God, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Today, in the church calendar, if we have follow our church calendar, it's, it's the Feast of Corpus Christi. It's not a feast that's made much of these days. It comes after Trinity Sunday, the Feast of the Body of Christ. And I suppose we call them feasts, the feast days, because traditionally they were associated with sacred meals, public celebrations. Here, Jesus is speaking of himself as the bread of life. And it's a fulfillment of the manna, miracle in the desert when God fed the people with manna, that miraculous food that they didn't quite know what, know what it was, but it was a bit like um, coriander seed and sweet and tasted like honey. It was said that the Messiah, when he came, would bring manna, and there's a sense in which the feeding miracles of Jesus and the Gospels where he feeds the 5,000, that that is a fulfillment of the manna in the desert that Moses, that Moses gave by God's miraculous gift. But obviously it goes much beyond that, that Jesus is the bread of life. When we say the Lord's Prayer, we say, give us this day, our daily bread. And it's quite difficult, really, to translate that word, our daily bread. It can mean our bread for the morrow. Or it can mean our necessary bread, the bread of our necessity. It's because the adjective isn't really one that has many other uses in Greek, so it's difficult to translate. It could be described as our super substantial bread, or as St. Jerome said, one of the early church writers, a bread surpassing all others. Jesus gives us the bread of life. We know what a substantial meal is. That's when you start with soup and you have a main course and perhaps a middle course, or like cheese, or in France they have a lettuce course, don't they? Um, never quite particularly got the hang of that. And then pudding. That would be a substantial meal. Jesus gives us bread, a meal, that is m more than ordinary things. He has, he has the extraordinary bread of life, the miraculous bread of life. But Jesus doesn't just say, I give you bread. He says, I am the bread of life. It's one of the great I am sayings where Jesus reveals something of himself and of his character, of his power, of his glory. I am the bread of life. No wonder that they disciples or the, pe the, the people that were listening said give us this bread always how we need Jesus in him is the life that matters eternal life is found in him it begins when we receive Jesus into our hearts that eternal life takes root now it begins now but it's a life that is strong enough to withstand anything even death itself and it's fruit is in the eternal life that we have with Jesus. So Jesus is the bread of life. He is the strength. He's what we need to get through life and to flourish in life. In himself, he is the bread of life. And that means that um, we should base our whole lives around him, around his teaching, around the events of his birth, his ministry, his suffering his death and resurrection and ascension and the giving of the Holy Spirit. His life is 
our spiritual food, our spiritual nourishment. His teaching is our spiritual nourishment. His person is our spiritual nourishment. So we have to feed on him. Another thought that came to me as I read that passage was a little bit in the Deuteronomy reading where it speaks about God having delivered the people of Israel, the Israelites, out of slave labor. And that, I suppose, is very relevant just now when we're um, hearing so much about the protesters in our society who are reminding us of our colonial past and, and a very checkered past, as it were, the way that our society in past centuries regarded and treated people of colour. And we have to remember that there was a struggle over the centuries, particularly in the, 7th, in the 18th and 19th century, um, over the Christian understanding of the Bible and what it said about slavery. There were those who said that slavery was sanctioned in the Bible and it should remain. But there were others who um, thought differently. One of them, of course, was William Wilberforce from the city of Hull. He came from Yorkshire. He was born in 1759, who complained about slavery, and his interpretation of the Bible was very different to the one that was prevalent at the time. He pointed out verses like Galatians, that in Christ there's neither male nor female, slave or free, but all are one in Christ Jesus. It was he who formed the organization called the Committee for the Abolition, Abolition of the Slave Trade, the Anti-Slavery Society, and campaigned for 50 years until he was in his 70s. He, that brought him into conflict and into trouble with many people. But eventually, the British government passed a law that stopped British people buying and selling slaves. But it was not until the month after William Wilberforce died that slavery was finally abolished in every country controlled by Britain. Today, um, I think we can be proud of our Christian heritage that um, there were people who were ahead of their time and who campaigned for a, a better society. Maybe that encourages us that we can do, we can campaign and we can do things today with God's help to address injustice and persecution. One of the great injustices today is the lack of freedom of Christians in countries in the world, in Africa and Asia, um, where it's not possible to worship free freely without the risk of persecution. Uh, amen and thanks be to God for these thoughts and to him be all glory and praise. I invite you to join with me in prayers. Let us pray. Father Almighty, Lord of all creation, God of grace, we bow before you. For you are the living God, the God who made all things. We thank you for our beautiful world, for the glories of the summer sunshine, for the beauties that we see around us, for nature, for animals, for birds, for flowers and things that grow, for the beauty of the flowers of the field. We thank you for our communities, our society, the people around us. But Lord, we long for a complete victory over the coronavirus. We trust that you have power to do that, Lord, we need you. We wait for you. We wait for you to come and restore us and revive your church again. Please bless those who are sick, those who are lying weak, those who are recovering from operations or hospital treatment, those who are recovering from injuries, and those who are suffering from COVID-19. Bring your healing and your peace. Bless those who are sorry and troubled and sorrowful 
Be their comfort, Lord. We pray for Christians in lands where it is difficult to worship in freedom, particularly in Pakistan, in Mozambique, in Nigeria. And that's just some, Lord. Be with your persecuted church. We pray for our society and the unrest that is difficult. We pray, Lord, that the voice of reason would prevail, that order would return where there's disorder, that peace where there's conflict, that forgiveness will be restored where needed, and that we'll all have true faith in you. And we sum up our prayer in the words that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever. Amen. And I want to close with some a rendering of Psalm 121 by John Campbell, who was Duke of Argyle. And to the hills around do I lift my longing eyes, for whence for me shall my salvation come, from whence arise? From God the Lord doth come my certain aid, from God the Lord who heaven and earth hath made. In the last verse, from every evil shall he keep thy soul, from every sin Jehovah shall preserve thy going out and thy coming in. Above thee watching, he whom we adore shall keep thee henceforth, yes, forevermore. Let's pause as we wait for God to come and bless us. Lord, may your blessing fall upon us afresh. We go in peace to love and serve the Lord. And may Almighty God bless us, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, both now and forevermore. Amen. Thank you for watching with me and sharing in this act of devotion. I pray that you'll have a very blessed Sunday and that you'll know God's blessing and peace. Bye for now.